Thank you, Cam, and thank you all for coming. And on behalf of the university, I think we must apologise for so many of you not having seats. Um, I shall not be offended if uh, you find that uh, you have to leave the room. Um, I too like to acknowledge the presence of the diplomatic corps here, the Australian intelligence community, uh, very senior academic colleagues uh, from the university. I'd like to thank the AIIA, ACT branch and the Strategic Defence Studies Centre and this research school for organising this. Welcome also to ANU students, some of you I know are also doing the master's programme at SDSC. To members of the AIIA, uh, it is a critically important organisation with, as you've heard, uh, an enormously long history and it contributes to the democratic public debate. And also to members of the public here who are none of the above. It is part of the ANU's outreach programme, part of its ANU's outreach programme to encourage discussions like this so that we have a much broader audience than the highly specialised academic ones. About an hour ago I got a phone call from Stephen Smith, the Minister for Defence, wanting to know if he could have a copy of my speech because he was about to go onto an aeroplane and fly overseas and I said to him, with due respect Minister, unlike you nobody writes my speeches. <laughs> I'm scribbling the notes as you ring. <laughs> you can watch the YouTube. <laughs> I am not an, a China expert. There are people here like Ross Tyrrell and Richard Rigby who are. I first went to China as uh, the first ever intelligence uh, invited a guest in 1978 as a guest of the Foreign Affairs Bureau. I reviewed the Six Tank Army at Ba Da Ling. Um, I was a bit younger then, by the way. And we believe I was the first Westerner to be invited to the Chinese submarine building yard in Shanghai and go on board a Chinese, that is a Russian submarine. The first time I'd been on a submarine, so our intelligence people were very disappointed when I came back, when I said, they said, what did you see? I said, I saw a lot of tubes and tiles. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, in my official and academic life, I've spent a long time in the United States. Uh, I've held American top secret absolute security clearances to do with satellite photography, Pine Gap, uh, Narunga, and a few other things. Um, as indeed other colleagues in this room have. I'd like to discuss three main issues with you this evening. The first one, as the title of the talk suggests, are the Chinese and the United States going to go to war? And I was a bit provoked on this by a statement by former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd uh, some weeks ago in which he liked, likened the risks of war with regard to the Senkaku Daiaoyu Islands as Sarajevo 1914 and major powers going to war. Well I must say I found that a stretch of his vivid imagination but he's provoked me into this. Secondly and associatedly I'd like to discuss is China the rising power, rising and rising with no problems and is America in inevitable decline? To answer the challenge of one of my colleagues Will the United States have to concede strategic space to China in Asia? If I get time, and most likely looking at my notes I won't, the third thing I'd like to discuss is what does all this mean for Australian defence policy? And if I don't get onto that, please feel free in the question time because as you've heard, uh, I'm not just a theoretician, I've been in the past a, a practitioner with regard to Australian defence policy. Now, as I said, I'm not a China expert, but I'm used to the sort of use of Chinese numerology, you know, from the Communist Party of China, you know, the 12 do's and the 14 don'ts. So I've got the three no's and the two yeses for you. <laughs> My three no's are as follow, follows. No, there will not be a major power war between China and the United States, but of course there is a risk of limited conflict. Number two. No, the United States is not in irretrievable decline and no China, in my view, is not on the inevitable rise and rise and rise with no weaknesses. And no, neither America nor anybody else is going to concede willingly a sphere of influence for China in such a place as Southeast Asia, which is what has been uh, recommended 
in certain quarters in this town and in an interesting recent fairly useless article in the journal Survival by an American. And the, and the final no is a no, we've no need to arm ourselves to fight war with China unlike what was implied in Rudd's 2009 defense white paper. The two yeses are, yes, we need to focus more on managing the peace in Asia and particularly in our own region, but we need to fix up the rules that are lacking in terms of uh, confidence building and preventive diplomacy. And I'm concerned about the lack of cohesion and strategic rigor, particularly in Southeast Asia, with regard to their approach to security and security organizations such as the ARF. And the second yes is, yes, we do need to spend more than 1.5% of GDP on defense as soon as the economy improves, but there is no urgency about it. Where is the clear and imminent threat? Turning now to my conceptual framework, as I think many of you know, I'm a considerable believer in the balance of power theory. I know there are some colleagues here who uh, don't care for that theory. Most of you are aware of the theory and how it worked in 19th century Europe and how there are speculations how it may or may not work in our region. The academic theory of the balance of power suggests that bipolarity such as existed between the former Soviet Union and the United States was inherently unstable because there were not enough players and that by comparison a multipolar situation with many players and checks and balances uh, is a more stable situation. That is a matter of judgment. Some of you will agree with that and some of you won't. I think there is too much of the debate, however, in this town about effectively thinking it's a bipolar position between the United States and China. Of course, that is the most crucial relationship that you people, including you young ones, will see through your lifetime. It is the most crucial relationship of all, the United States China relationship. But we must not just accept that there is a bipolar relationship. There are major players on the rise as well. Look at India, look at Indonesia, look at Vietnam, look at the ROK, and major players already established like Japan, and players that may or may not have a future as a major power like Russia. So one way or another, and however you interpret it, and you're welcome to your own views on this, we have a fairly complicated and competitive multipolar power situation. Next, as you know, writers have written about the rise and fall of nations throughout history and speculated on the cause for the rise and fall, and again there are many views on this. The most prominent book in recent decades was Paul Krugman's book, um, in which he proclaimed that economic growth was at the essence of the rise and fall of powers and without great economic power you can't be a great military power and you can't have great influence. Again that is a contentious judgment. I particularly like Paul Krugman by the way because towards the end of his book which was written in the late 80s he cited my then just published book on the Soviet Union which I call the incomplete superpower which was not a welcome book in certain quarters in the United States in 89 not least not welcome in a place called Langley. But they got it wrong and I got it right. Um, and Krugman quoted this book of mine at length in his last chapter, so look, he's, his book is a really good book. <laughs> Krugman, I think, tends to underrate domestic, social and political fragilities, and I want to come on to those with regard to China, and indeed, we need to debate those in the United States. There are conceptually, in any case, two key points for strategic policy makers in the issue I'm about to discuss. And again, one of these at least is contentious, the other in my view is not, but we'll see. The first one is that we're now in a period of economic interdependence the like of which the world has never seen. Some argue that at the turn of the last century, in the early 1900s, that was the last time when the world was so economically interdependent in terms of trade, investment, new technologies, you know, the aeroplane, the telephone, whatever, telegraph, 
and indeed travel. But you look at the depth of economic interdependence now, you look at the products you buy. My favourite example is my iPhone and my iPad. Where is it invented? Well, it wouldn't surprise me, not invented in China, invented in the United States. Where are some of the bits of kit made, including with rare earths? Japan. And where are they assembled with only 30% value added? In China. And you can go on about that if you, you know, I recommend to you when you buy products, just have a look. Where are they made? You know, and, and how many countries are involved? And I would put it to you that the global supply chains, including in the area I'm deeply involved with, that is defence policy and defence equipment, um, there is a very complicated and tenuous global supply chain. It depends on just-in-time delivery in many ways. Of course, if I can criticise myself, there was a famous professor of international relations in 1910 called Norman Angel, who wrote a book called The Great Illusion, who proclaimed, and I see the ambassador's nod in his head, who proclaimed 1910 that uh, uh, the Kaisers, Germany and Britain were so interdependent on each other economically, technologically, travel, royal family, that it was absolutely insane to think that war would break out. And of course, four years later it did. But that was then, and now is now. And I would say that the interdependence economically now is an order of magnitude, or several order of magnitude different. The second one, and you'll make your own mind up on that one. I think I'm on much firmer ground, I believe, on the second fundamental strategic policy issue that will inhibit war in our region, and that is plain and simple nuclear deterrence. It has worked for over 70 years. And as close as the Soviet Union and the United States got in the Cuban Missile Crisis in 62, and in my experience as head of in defense intelligence, a damn sight closer to nuclear war in 1983, war did not happen, not nuclear, not conventional, because each side aimed to destroy the other side, as we used to say, as functioning modern societies. That is, you aim to wipe out the Americans aimed to wipe out the Soviet Union population by 50% in the first 24 hours. So you get 100 million dead in 24 hours. Uh, it's called the end of the world. We used to talk about nuclear winter. So this issue now, and it's a current issue with regard uh, to the alleged build-up of China's nuclear weapons and whether there's a stable deterrence and first strike versus second strike and so on. Some people believe that in the event of a limited conflict between the United States and China, which would escalate, that for instance, says one theory, um, China could drop a nuclear weapon on the American base in Guam, and the Americans wouldn't dare do anything about it because of the risk to Los Angeles and New York. All I can say is the people who believe that don't understand the United States and how when it decides to go to war, it don't mess around. It don't mess around at all. Look at Iraq. Look at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's a myth, by the way, that democracies, um, when they go to war, don't go to war violently and don't demand unconditional surrender. So what are the risks of war? Let's start with Taiwan. And let me quote last week's uh, Chinese PLA defense white paper, in which that white paper said, and I quote, Cross-straits relations are sustaining a momentum of peaceful development. I think that's dead right. I think we've largely gotten over the risk that Taiwan might unilaterally declare independence and thereby undoubtedly provoke China. And that would not be anything in any case that the United States would want. And as far as we are Australians are concerned, you need to think that if there were, if there was a war across the Taiwan Straits, in which American troops are getting killed, the Americans, in my view, would immediately invoke the ANZUS Treaty, which says, worse the effect, in the event of an attack on the troops of the two contracting parties, their ships or aircraft in the Pacific area, we shall immediately consult. But for us not to actually be involved in such a conflict, if it was Chinese aggression unprovoked, unprovoked, by Taiwanese declaration of independence. That would raise very serious foreign and defense policy issues for us. But you know, as former minister Alexander Downer said when he was once questioned on this, 
They are hypothetical questions which I refuse to answer. <laughs> Very wise minister. And I think, you know, we can, we can talk about what would happen, but I think we have to say the prospect of war between the United States and China over the Taiwan Straits these days is highly unlikely. And as the Chinese White Paper says, the cross-straits relations are sustaining a momentum of peaceful momentum, peaceful development, and dare one say it, increasing economic interdependence. The second one is more serious, and there are people in this room who know more about this, and just remember I don't get intelligence updates these days. North Korea, a much more dangerous <coughs> situation than Taiwan. You can't rule out a stupid, nil-calculated use of a nuclear weapon by this 28-year-old seeking to impress his military bosses. But it's not in the interest not only of the United States and South Korea, demonstrably, given where Seoul is with regard to the Korean border, but I would argue it's certainly not in China's interest. Look how China has distanced itself of late from the DPRK. And by the way, in the event it was an outright DPRK use, for instance, of a nuclear weapon against the South, somebody needs to tell the leadership in Pyongyang as I've just said earlier, the response from the United States would be overwhelming and massive. Hmm? So let's put it in the more dangerous situation, but still unlikely. I won't say very unlikely, but unlikely. I think the East China Sea, Senkaku Daru, and the South China Sea, and the issue of Chinese claims in the South China Sea and the so-called Nine Dotted Line, has pushed members of ASEAN away from China and closer to the United States, not all members of ASEAN, but a significant number, not, as a least, not least as a result of the meeting of the ASEAN ministers in Phnom Penh uh, last June, when clearly the Chinese foreign ministry lent on the Cambodian leadership. As we speak today, some of you may have heard the news that near the Senkaku Islands there are some um, uh, Japanese um, citizens um, occupying the island and that there are Chinese surveillance vessels, allegedly eight of them, uh, coming close to the waters and I think, and I can only quote to the news, that the Japanese Prime Minister has said that any um, Chinese people landing on the Senkakus will be deported. I suppose that will be the sort of Japanese version of illegal refugees, uh, you know. Um, but I do not think, even if something happened over Senkaku's and there was an exchange of fire, and remember there was allegations a few weeks ago that a uh, Chinese uh, boat had uh, done a radar lock-on um, to a Japanese boat, that whilst one cannot eliminate conflict by miscalculation, you would hope and expect it would be limited. And it is easier to limit and constrain conflict on the high seas than it is not in the First World War across long borders with mobilization timetables, I would argue. But there is a risk of miscalculation. A recent round report has looked at the prospects of war over the next 30 years between the United States and China uh, in all those issues I've mentioned and says their assessment is very unlikely. And the RAND Corporation, dare one say it, it's not one, some left-wing socialist tree-hugging organisation, you know? It ain't. Australia in the Asia Century, our white paper earlier this year, says very much the same thing about major power war being unlikely, or some would say less than remote. And I suspect that the forthcoming defence white paper, but, that I imagine may well be out next month, uh, will have much the same view. So let's turn then to the relative power of China and the United States. A very vexed question. You'll have your own views, and you must have your own views. It's one of the crucial issues for you people to think about and determine uh, in the coming decades. How out of balance will the relationship between China and the United States get? My view is quite simple. I acknowledge the rise of China's power, and I think a lot of that is to be welcome. However, the jury is out as to how China uses military power in future, and the pushing and shoving in the South China Sea and the Senkakus of late 
has not been so reassuring. But China is not the former Soviet Union in military power, and it's not the United States now or foreseeably. It is, to use the title of a book by Susan Shirk, who was Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, her book was called China, the Fragile Superpower. So you see, I had the Soviet Union, the incomplete superpower, and she has the fragile one. And I think there's a great deal of truth in it, and she, she concentrates on, here's a power that's becoming increasingly confident and strong abroad, but is fragile domestically. And there are people like Ross Terrell and Richard Rigby here who may well have different views, and I'd be interested to hear them. I think in any case, militarily, China has, is a long way behind the United States. It is true that in close approaches to China, China is developing some capable issues. But who actually thinks that the United States is going to sit on its behind and do nothing about it? This highly innovative United States that accounts for half of the world's military expenditure, and on my calculations, that accounts for close to 80% of advanced military R&D in the world. Hmm? Who else does advanced military R&D? Well, China a bit, Britain, my old country, a bit, the French, a bit, and the Russians, well, they've been in free fall for 20 years. Let's have a quick look at both these countries, China and the United States, and I apologise, it's going to be very brutal. You all know the figures that China's economy has eclipsed and outrun that of um, Japan in GDP terms. And it depends whether you use exchange rate equivalents or purchasing power parity as to whether you think the Chinese economy will be bigger than that of the United States in about, I don't know, 2020, 2028, whatever. That will still not make China as rich a country as the United States. And there are interesting issues about what it spends on R&D and innovation, given its rather disciplined education system. In any case, one of the key weaknesses, I believe, of China is, if I'm right, by 2015, two years from now, the Chinese workforce will start to decline in absolute numbers because of the one-child policy, and there's nothing they can do about it. And the figures I have is that by about 2040, over 380 million Chinese will be over the age of 60. If you think those two things I've just given you don't have serious geopolitical implications, you'd be wrong. Already Chinese labour rates are going up and some companies soon will be looking at India, Vietnam, Indonesia. And when you've got nearly 400 million people over the age of 60 and you don't have a good health care system, age care system, and indeed good health system, the sort of money you're going to have to apply to aged care is serious, as we know only too well, don't we? You, you know the issue of growing social disturbances in China, reaction to income in, inequalities between the urban <coughs> east and the inland China, where I've never been, but which I understand <coughs> enormous backward uh, elements to it in terms of economic development. The corruption that is acknowledged by successive Chinese leadership, but which they seem to do little about. The costs of health and aged care and unemployment benefits, all those things I've mentioned. Turning to its military capabilities, let me just quote to you from a forthcoming article in the China Quarterly by Adam Liff and Andrew Erickson, who've done a thing on demystifying China's defense spending. And looking at their footnotes, unlike me, they clearly um, read Chinese. They say the following. Developing the capabilities necessary to wage high or even medium intensity warfare beyond China's immediate vicinity would require significant additional increase in the defence budget and heavy investment in new platforms, weapons and related systems, as well as training, operations and maintenance, not to mention some form of support infrastructure aboard, abroad. If China decides to develop significant power projection capabilities, its investments are likely to be increasingly inefficient and provide significantly less bang for a significantly larger buck. And they say, look into the future. Defence budget growth in China will face increasingly powerful headwinds as a motley of domestic and social challenges demand the attention of Chinese leaders. A rapidly ageing society will inevitably generate higher economic and social service expectations, which may well exacerbate extant domestic instability, they say. 
and even if defence spending continues to grow, internal PLA factors such as rapidly rising equipment and personnel costs, not to mention corruption, all but guarantee diminishing returns and will li limit improvements to overall Chinese force structure and capabilities. And they summarise this by saying, in short, it seems clear that the future pace and scope of China's military development will depend upon the health and wealth of the nation. Now, I don't have time to go through some of the undoubted Chinese uh, developments in what's called area denial, anti-access capabilities, and how the United States is developing what's called an air-sea battle to respond to that. I refer you to an, ex an excellent article that ASPI, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, has published by a former colleague of ours, Benjamin Schreer, on this very subject. I will just note in, in passing, uh, most Chinese submarines, not least their nuclear ones, are quite noisy. Their older submarines are hand-me-downs from the Russians, and they're still buying Russian submarines. And is America good at ASW? Yes. And is America and Japan developing a submarine detection capability along the Okinawa chain to bottle up the Northern Fleet? Yeah. The Chinese have been trying for 35 years, to my certain knowledge, to develop a high-performance military jet engine, which is very demanding and technically difficult. And they have not succeeded. Where do they get these jet engines from? A place called Russia, whose defence industry, as I've said, has been in free fall for 20 years. Then we have this much vaunted, crappy old aircraft carrier, which was called the Variag, whatever it's called in Chinese. Who believes a 1970s Russian technology aircraft carrier is the start of an aircraft carrier capability? The Americans have been at it for 70 years, and it would be a no game. I could go on about the so-called DF-21, anti-aircraft carrier ballistic missile. Well, have they ever tested one against a target moving at 50 knots, like a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier can? And if it misses the target with a conventional warhead by 200 metres, they've wasted a shot. And if they use a nuclear warhead, guess what? The game's on. We can talk about the so-called stealth fighter, which has been peddled out onto the runway. Is that a fifth-generation fighter like an F-22 or a JSF? No. And then we have a country called China that has no experience of modern war whatsoever. Mass peasant armies blowing bugles in the Korean War. And when I was Deputy Head of Defence Intelligence, we watched very closely the Chinese teaching Vietnam a lesson. You remember that one, Doug? In 1978. Guess what? Who won? Well, certainly not the Chinese. They faced up to a battle-hardened North Vietnamese army, which we knew early too well. So, yes, the Chinese are making advances, there's no doubt about that, and they need a capacity to defend themselves. And close in, it's going to be a greater challenge for the Americans if push comes to shove. And at distance, it's going to be still a weak force on the Chinese part, and by 2030, which will be the strongest military power in the world, without doubt, the United States of America. Moving on quickly to the United States then. Yes, its economy is in trouble. And if they don't turn around from this global financial crisis and get back to dynamic rates of growth, if they don't do that over a period of years, then I will have to qualify what I'm telling you, OK? I have a bit more confidence in the American economy than that. I certainly have a lot of confidence, a lot of confidence, in the dynamic inventiveness of the American people, like no other. I mean, you younger people, you use all these things I don't use, like Facebook and Twitter and all that stuff. Who invents all that? Who invents, you know, the most capable advanced military equipment in the world? And not just the kit I've talked about, but command and control, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, overhead satellite <coughs> systems, which we in Australia have privileged access to, the likes of which the Chinese are not in the same ballgame about. Yes, they're making advances. And as for the demography of America, unlike China, America does not have an aging population. It is a young population. It's 300 million people that are growing strongly. Uh, with, you know, the young uh, Hispano, uh, uh, Hispanic um, uh, contribution to the population. So unlike China, they don't face a decline in population. Yes, in addition to the economy problem, I acknowledge there is political uh, gridlock. 
And again, it is disappointed the Americans are, are log, locked into that situation. So there are some qualifications, but in the end, the country that sees itself as the exceptional society, the light on the hill, in God we trust, all that stuff, don't underrate them. So, do I believe that the United States will have to concede strategic space any time soon to China? Absolutely not. Why should they? And if they were to concede Southeast Asia as a sphere of influence to China, where would that leave Australia's defence policy? Given that Southeast Asia sits on the northern approaches to Australia, like a strategic shield, if things go well, and it would be the direction from or through which we would be attacked should it not go well. Some people are saying that America will be so weak in its inevitable decline and China will be so strong that Japan will cast itself free of the alliance and develop nuclear weapons. Well, who actually believes that, given where the Japanese are on matters nuclear? You know, I was in Japan at the time of the earthquake and the Fukushima issue and look what that has done to their nuclear reversion. And would we and America and South Korea and China want Japan to go nuclear? No. And where is the regional correlation of forces, as the Marxists used to say in the Soviet Union? The regional correlation of world forces. Well, who are China's great friends and allies? Well, it's not a spectacular lineup, is it? The DPRK, close to a lunatic society, you know? Pakistan, close to a failed state, a nuclear armed. Until recently, Myanmar, who suddenly decided, don't like the Chinese, cast their lot in with the West. And who else? Who else? And on the American side, You've got Japan, the ROK. In my view, most, if not all, of the ASEANs move in not to an alliance with America, but increasingly cautious about the way in which China is throwing its weight around in the South China Sea. So, from the United States Washington point of view, the correlation of forces of allies and friends is formidable. I'm going to quickly then just spend a couple of minutes on what I promised, and that is. Australia and China. The two most powerful bureaucrats in this town, the Secretary of Defence, Dennis Richardson, and the Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Peter Varghese, have both said that the so-called choice that some say we have to make between China and the United States is a false choice, and I agree with them. Why would we have to choose? You know, in the practical world of diplomacy and policy, it's actually possible to walk and chew gum at the same time. You know, it really is. I mean, it's like some of my academic friends, you know, type me as a, a, as a hardline defense realist. Yeah, well, when you sit in the Department of Defense ordering weapon systems, which are meant to kill people, you're actually a realist. But you also run a program called the Defense Cooperation Program in Southeast Asia in the South Pacific that, you know, is liberal institutionalism, if you like. So the real world of policy is not like the world of academia, where you're either a realist or a liberal institutionalist, or you know you're for this or against that. It is more sophisticated, frankly. Um, and, does either the, and does either the United States or China believe they have to choose between each other and friends and allies? And do other countries, not just Australia, but do other countries believe they have to choose? Does Japan believe it has to choose, or they are okay? Or can they believe they can do both things? There is only one codicil and caution to this, and that is, there will be a compulsion to choose if China becomes militarily aggressive and expansionist, and I don't see that. I mean, yeah, it's monkeying around in the South China Sea and it needs to behave itself more, and it needs to be careful about the Senkakus, but this is not the former Soviet Union, hell-bent on territorial expansion. You know? Or indeed, these days in China, hell-bent on ideological expansion. No, it's not. There are dangers, however, as Suzanne Shirk would say about the fragile superpower, that if the internal challenges and problems in China become more serious, 
And as people drift away from really believing in communism to actually expecting the sort of devil's deal is we let you rule us, even though you're not legitimately in power as the Communist Party of China, as long as you deliver the economic welfare. Should that falter, Suzanne Shirk talks about, would then a Chinese leadership focus on external aggression? Well, that's a series of ifs, isn't it? That's a series of ifs. And that's neither good intelligence nor good policy. Finally, for Australia. After 11 years in Afghanistan, Australia needs to focus on our own region and not dreaming about going to war with China or to use a phrase of one of Kevin Rudd's external advisers to the 2009 white paper as developing a capability, listen to this, to tear an arm off China. I mean, you know how lunatic is that? That particular person was proposing that we put Tomahawk land attack cruise missile on the next generation of submarines in order to target the Chinese leadership. This is a well-known fact around this town. Let me stress that person was not a policy officer and, um, and we have none of that in the current inputs to this current white paper as far as I can see. You remember early on I said we need to focus more on managing the peace, on thinking about going to major power war, and to do that, we need to do two things. We need to strengthen confidence building and preventive diplomacy. The thing I'm about this, with this ASEAN Regional Forum thing I've been to for six years, and I'm about to go to in three weeks' time to Honolulu to talk yet again with 27 countries about preventive diplomacy. The disappointing issue in those meetings is I've tried for five of those six years to get the Chinese delegate, who's generally a retired, very senior ambassador, to agree to a discussion, that's all, a discussion, on an avoidance of naval incidents at sea agreement like the Soviet Union had with the United States in 1972, which said, warships in close proximity to each other shall not point guns, missile systems, or lasers on each other, shall not illuminate the bridges of warships with high-powered lasers, and shall not interfere with the line of uh, direction of a warship taking off or landing aircraft. And it had some similar ca cautions about aircraft. And the fact is that Japan has an agreement with Russia on, in that regard, in which the wording is taken directly from the 1972 US Soviet agreement. And the ROK has an agreement using exactly the same words as the 1972 US Soviet agreement and yet the Chinese will not even discuss the issue and what is the problem here? What is the problem here? The second thing we need to do is to recognize that Southeast Asia is the linchpin of the Indo-Pacific region which is not an entity it's an embryonic strategic concept but if you look at a map going from the west coast of Africa through to the Pacific Southeast Asia sits there as the linchpin. You remember I say, from an Australian point of view, it is our strategic shield. If things go right, it would not be a strategic shield if the United States conceded a sphere of influence, which it isn't going to do, uh, to China in that regard. So we need to focus more on Southeast Asia, and in particular I think a number of us are concerned about the lack of strategic direction and cohesion in ASEAN and about the security organizations like ASEAN and the ARF which are good at talking, they're talk shops but they're not good at getting something going forward but they're trying to do that with the Chinese on a code of conduct in the South China Sea and again with very little good response I'm afraid from uh, China. So you see those of you who think I'm only a realist can see that defense policy is not just about war fighting, it's about confidence building, preventive diplomacy, encouraging regional cohesion. Final two points. Do we need to spend three or four percent of GDP on defense against a mythical China threat? Demonstrably and absolutely not. But we do need to spend more than the 1.5 percent of GDP at present which is the lowest since 1938. That is not to drum up threats of, you know, the Sudetenland and here comes Hitler. It is just that in my experience, something around about 2% of GDP is more likely to sustain a defense force of less than 60,000 
but with modern submarines, aircraft and other equipment to make sure that we have a clear margin of technological advantage in our region, which successive governments, both Coalition and Labour, have supported since the Kim Beasley White Paper of 1987. So, our focus needs to be on our own region, and let me just finish by saying what that region is in military operational terms. It's clearly not the Indo-Pacific, all of it, and it's clearly not all of Asia. In terms of operational and force structure priorities, my definition of our region is the Eastern Indian Ocean, Southeast Asia, including the waters of Southeast Asia, therefore the South China Sea, plus the South Pacific and our Southern Ocean approaches down to Antarctica. On my rough estimate, that adds up to more than 10% of the Earth's surface. That's more than enough of a challenge for an ADF of 59,000 people without us drumming up threats of going to war with China. Thank you. Mm -hmm.